My name is Philip Benfi. I'm a professor in the biology department at Duke University. I'm also an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today I'd like to tell you about some of the work that we do with root genetics. And you, the first question you might ask is why even study plants, much less roots? And I would present to you the idea that plants are actually at the center of some of the major problems facing the world today. The first one would be climate change. Climate change is affecting both agriculture and in all sorts of other ways, affecting the way plants grow and survive. But I also present to you the fact that plants can have a positive role in mitigating the effects of climate change. Secondly would be nutrition and health. That is, plants are the source of much of our diet, and there are many malnourished people in the world or undernourished, and plants play a very important role in combating malnutrition. Lastly, I would say for clean energy, there are lots of, of uses of energy that are, need liquid forms, transportation fuels, jet fuels, for example. And plants are an alternative for providing a, a liquid form of clean energy for those uses. So coming back to roots, we study roots for many reasons that I'll tell you about. But most people don't think about roots because you don't see them. They're out of sight, out of mind. But they also, for the plant, play a really critical role. They're the major place where plants acquire their water. Water comes up through the roots. Also nutrients, nitrogen, phosphate, etc., is acquired by the plants from the roots. Roots are also provide anchoring. Without roots, plants fall over. And finally, roots are the place that that plants interact with microbes in the soil, including microbes that are, that, that are there for, for example, nodules on soybeans that, that um, fix nitrogen. Now, plants are not the same as animals in the way they grow. In an animal you grow with the, the embryo has almost all of the organs that you will have in the adult. And when you go from the embryo to the adult, mainly what you're doing is increasing the size of those organs sometimes increasing their complexity. For a plant in the embryo, you really just have a, 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 the mere sort of uh, outline of what that plant will look like. And the reason is that plants grow from the top and the bottom with use of stem cells. And from those stem cells, you get every other part of the plant. That is the, the flowers, the leaves, and all of the root tissue. As you look at the root tissue, particularly the root tissue of the plant that we work on, which is Arabidopsis thaliana, you see also some simplifying aspects, some of the things that attracted us to work on roots in the first place. If you slice through the root, you see that in the, that circular piece of root, each of the different colors is a different tissue within the root. From the outside in, that red tissue is the epidermis, then you have the blue, which is the cortex. Inside that, the green is the endodermis. And if you rotate the root, you'll find that you have exactly the same tissues in exactly the same places. There is radial symmetry to the root, and that greatly simplifies how one analyzes the organ. Another great simplifying factor of the root is that the stem cells, the cells that give rise to all the other cells in the root, are located at the tip of the root, and they are, for, for Arabidopsis at least, that, that part of the root is translucent. You can see right through it with, with a microscope. Now what I'm going to tell you about is how we've used genetics to analyze root development. Genetics were actually invented, discovered, by Gregor Mendel using plants. In his garden, he looked at pea plants and saw plants that had different flowers, different leaves, etc. Now, I, in my, when I started my independent career, I looked for mutants in roots that were different from the wild type, the normal. As you see here on the left, are the, uh, that's the wild type root, and then we have two sets of mutants next to it. And the way we grow our, our, our roots are, are on a flat petri dish, and the petri dish is placed upright so that the roots grow along the surface of the petri dish, and we can see all sorts of differences in this case, it was a very simple difference. The difference was just a matter of length of the root. One was growing a lot slower than the other. And we named one of these mutants, perhaps not very imaginatively, short root because it had a shorter root. 
And then only later we discovered another mutant, and then we realized there was something more going on, and we gave it a little better name, which we called Scarecrow. Now, what is going wrong with these roots? Why are they shorter? Well, it turns out they're actually missing one of those tissues that I discussed a minute ago. That is, if you look at the wild type, now we have a real section through the root on the left-hand side. We have the outer layer of epidermis. The next layer in that is, has the little black stars in it is cortex. The layer inside that is endodermis. And then internal to that is the vascular tissue, the very small cells. So there are two layers, each with eight cells. You look at short root. Short root has an outer layer of epidermis. It has those small cells in the middle, the vascular tissue. But in between, there's only a single layer, not the two layers that you see in wild type. Scarecrow, similarly, only a single layer between that outer layer and the central layer. And that is sort of like, these are real tissues. These are functioning tissues that play key roles. So it's as if these plants are missing something like a kidney or a liver in an animal. Now, what we do in genetics is try to understand what's really gone wrong with these. When we compare the mutant to the wild type, there's a great leap of faith of genetics, which is if we can precisely define the difference between the mutant and the wild type, the mutant and the normal, that will tell us what the gene does in the normal situation. Let me walk you through this. So when we looked at the at short root and scarecrow, we said, why does it have only a single layer? Well, we realized that what happens at the tip of the root, there is a stem cell, the green cell, that divides first along the transverse axis. And it does that, it has to regenerate itself. That's what all stem cells do. The upper cell then, the daughter cell, divides along the longitudinal axis to give the first two cells of the cortex and endodermis limit lineages. The yellow on the outside is the cortex, the blue on the inside is the endodermis. And so because there's only a single layer in short root and scarecrow, that means that second division hasn't occurred. So that's one of the things that both of these proteins must be doing in the wild type situation. There's another thing though, that as we looked at these mutants using different markers, different ways of characterizing the, the, the actual cell types, we realized that in short root, it's actually entirely missing the markers, the characteristics of the inner layer of the endodermis. So the, the division doesn't occur and it never specifies endodermis. In Scarecrow, again, the division doesn't occur, but we found characteristics of both endodermis and cortex in that single cell layer. So what does this mean? It means that as we think about these, short root must do two things. The short root protein, that is the original non-mutated form, must be, is critical to get that division to occur and then specify the endodermis. While Scarecrow, because it has both endodermal and cortex attributes, its primary role must be to get that division to occur. Once we've, we had figured out what the mutants are probably about, that is what the wild type does and what the mutant is, is missing, we then, our next goal was to identify the actual gene that had been disrupted when in, the, in the mutant. We found Scarecrow, and the next thing after that, we, we identified the gene, we clone it, that is we isolate the DNA, and then we said, well, where is that gene normally expressed? And we can look at this in a number of ways. What I'm showing here is where we use its promoter and we drive the green fluorescent protein. This is something that came out of jellyfish that when you shine laser light on it, it becomes green. So the green part here is where this gene would be expressed if you used its promoter, the regulatory part of that gene, fused to GFP, you see more or less what we would have expected. That is, it's expressed in that stem cell prior to the division, and is expressed in all of the endodermal cells after the division. And the same is true for the protein. For the protein, what we did was we used the same regulatory region. We fused it to the coding region for Scarecrow, that is the part of the DNA that codes for the protein, fused that directly to GFP. So we have a fusion protein of Scarecrow with GFP, put that back into a mutant, show that it actually rescues the mutant phenotype. It looks wild type now. And again, it looks exactly what, like what we would expect. It looks very similar to the RNA. When we looked at short root, however, we got a surprise. Short root, it's RNA expression, either using the GFP approach, which you see on the right, 
or using a probe that we're looking directly at the RNA. This is called an in situ hybridization on the left. It's not where we expect it. It's in the small tissue cells of the vascular tissue in the center. It's not in the cell that has to divide. It's not in the endodermis. So how could it be sending the information over to get that division to occur and the endodermis specified? Well, in animals, it's well known that transcription factors, these are genes that make proteins that bind to DNA, that these can go into the nucleus where the DNA is and turn on other genes, make small proteins that would then move from one cell to the next. They would interact with another protein, a receptor, and then we get other things to happen. We have another hypothesis to test, which is in plants there are channels between adjacent cells. These are called plasmodesmata, and proteins can actually physically move from one cell to the next. And this turned out to be what was happening in short root. So on the left, again, we have the RNA expression, short root promoter, the regulatory region of the DNA, fused to GFP, so we, this is the, what the RNA looks like. On the right, we see the same promoter driving short root coding region fused to GFP, and now you can see that the protein is found exactly where we would predict. That is, it's found in the, the, the um, stem cell prior to division and in all the endodermal cells, and it's found in the nuclei where the DNA is in all those cells. So why have it expressed only in that location? What happens, why not just express this protein if it's so important in just the, the endodermal cells and, that, uh, and the stem cell? So we ask this question by using the scarecrow promoter now, the one that's expressed only in the endodermis. If we derive the short root protein with the scarecrow protein, what happens? What happens, as you see in the image on the right, is we get something that looks like the, a cut-off tree trunk. We get lots and lots of a new layers. So clearly there's something about that the regulation of short root, having it only move one layer over, that really is critical to getting the right formation of the tissues in the right places. So in summary, what I've told you about is that studying plants can help address some of the major issues facing the planet today. And when studying plants, a focus on roots is important because roots are really critical for plant growth and health. Then I described a genetic screen for mutants with shorter roots. And somewhat surprisingly, from that mutant screen, we found two mutants where there was an entire cell layer that was missing. These were short root and scarecrow. And then we looked closer at short root and found that it's its gene product, a transcription factor, actually physically moves from one cell to the next. Expression of short root in the endodermis, where it's not supposed to be expressed, does something very surprising, which is it causes many additional layers of, of uh, tissue to be formed, strongly su suggesting that it's supposed to be expressed where it is and there's tight regulation of its movement. So, I would like to thank the members of my laboratory who did all of this work, both past and present, our funding sources, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the National Science Foundation. If you'd like to learn more about the work that goes on in our lab, you can go to the iBiology series where there are two episodes featuring our work. Mm -hmm.